Good morning, everyone. I am Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Thank you for joining us for History is Lunch here in the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium. If you have not already, please silence your cell phones. We'll be live streaming this, and it will be available anytime on Facebook after it's over. I saw a lot of you at last night's program at the Old Capitol, uh, Paula J. Giddings and her talk on Ida B. Wells and the anti-lynching campaign. Thank you, that was great. And um, we did shoot video of that. We'll try to get that up soon. Um, a couple of things that are coming up to know about. Starting tomorrow here in this space is the Historical Society annual meeting. There is still time to get in on that. Um, there are registration forms off to the left. Some of the topics that uh, will be covered by the symposia are the blues, the civil rights movement, World War I, and women's suffrage. And then Thursday of next week, on March the 8th, from 4 to 6 p.m., will be the fourth annual Betty Jolly Lecture at the Royal Welty House. Join us for an afternoon in the garden with Alice McDermott, whose book Charming Billy won the American Book Award for Fiction. It's free of charge, no reservations required. You can check out the Welty House website or uh, Facebook to find out more details about that. And then I hope that you will join us here next week when Gene Daddle and Otis Sanford will be our speakers. They will present Reckoning with Race, the Perspective of Two Native Mississippians. Today, though, we are delighted to have our friend Heather A. Wilcox with us to present Mount Olive, Preserving and Restoring a Historic Cemetery. Heather earned her BA in Women's Studies from the University of Kansas and her MA in Urban and Regional Planning from Jackson State University. She is staff liaison between JSU and the community surrounding the school, and in that capacity, Wilcox coordinates development activities for community residents, JSU students, neighborhood associations, businesses, and other community stakeholders. She served as project lead on this preservation of Mount Olive Cemetery, has helped build community gardens, created little free libraries in West Jackson, and operates the West Jackson blog. This is a really amazing project. We are delighted to have been involved in some small way, and we are really excited to have Heather here with us today. Help me welcome Heather Wilcox. Good afternoon, everyone. Oh. Hello, hello. Oh, sorry, okay. Um, well, thank you so much for coming out today. I am excited to be here and uh, present the project of Mount Olive Cemetery. Um, it's been a three-year project thus far, and um, I'm just really thrilled to work for Jackson State University, who supports this project, and um, everyone that's here today, it's really, really meaningful. So I'm going to get right into the presentation. Um, I know normally we wait till questions at the end, but I have slides, so I can't get off track. So if you have questions throughout the presentation, I would encourage you to ask them then, and then there will be time for questions at the end as well. So Mount Olive Cemetery is located on um, John R. Lynch Street, and this is Jackson State University's main campus here. This is Dalton Street, and this is actually the cemetery site. It's four acres, and um, it is on the main thoroughfare into Jackson State University. This is the College of Business, and this is the College of Liberal Arts, and this is the Gibbs Green Plaza. So this is currently what Mount Olive Cemetery looks like. Um, it has a brick fence in the front here on Lynch Street. And then this street, um, it is open um, to the public. And this is the only sign on um, the cemetery, which details Mount Olive Cemetery. And so when I first came to Jackson State about 10 years ago, I would walk past the cemetery and just wonder and ponder about what the meaning and who was buried there. And so um, through the university, we approached um, Archives and History, Mississippi Department of Archives and History, and we set out to do three things for the cemetery. We wanted to write the nomination packet to get it listed on the National Register of Historic Places. We also wanted to research and document who was buried in the cemetery. And there are two beautiful statues in the cemetery of Jim Hill and I. Revels Redmond, and we wanted to preserve those um, statues. 
So just to give you a historical context, this is Jackson State University in the early 1900s. This is Air Hall that is still here, and these are buildings, Barrett Hall, that are no longer in existence. But if you go further down this way, that's where you would see the cemetery. But this just gives you the context of the rural nature of the area um, during the early 1900s. And so um, when we set out to do this research almost three years ago, I came across this news article in 1988, and it was about someone who was concerned about the cemetery, who wanted to do things to beautify it and restore it. Um, however, when I started working on the cemetery, it was still in the same conditions that it was almost 30 years ago. And so I guess when you start out and you have a passion, I would just say be encouraged and don't give up. Up. Um, because you will, it, this is this is a hard project, um, and doing historic preservation is a, is a hard journey. But um, at the end, there is um, light at the end of the tunnel. Um, this is a picture of actually Pamela Jr.'s family standing in front of the cemetery um, in the maybe mid-50s. And so um, a lot of people will tell me, you know, Heather, we used to play in the cemetery, and um, we have very fond memories of walking through the cemetery. And so the cemetery represents so much for our community, and so it really struck a nerve with the community once we were able to complete this research and um, do the research. And so um, it is something that also uh, the community that surrounds Jackson State University supports, as well as Miss Junior. So we, uh, I went down to Archives and History and we pulled this document that Mississippi State Architecture students did in 1999. And it actually details burial sites, um, the headstones um, of everyone, well, who we thought was buried in the cemetery at that time. And we saw 268 burial sites at that time. And so this is a map of that. Um, the cemetery, but you can see there's open spaces here, and so we pretty much knew that there was more than 268 burials, but this is what we had on record when we began the research, and this is just a, um, a closer up map that, you know, we can make available to everyone. So we said, okay, well, how do we determine who is buried in the cemetery? So what we decided to do is we decided to go down to archives and history and pull death records, um, and in the death Death record, you'll see, you can tell where people are buried um, at the bottom right corner. So here it clearly states that they're buried in Mount Olive. Now, let me just say this. So death records are only sorted by counties. And so um, we literally had to pull every single death record in Hines County to determine who was buried in Mount Olive. And uh, I don't see Jan Hilligus here, but she was my partner in crime. And let's just say we just spent almost 200 hours uh, pulling death records over a course of the year because um, we had to go through everyone to make sure that we knew who was buried in the cemetery. So again, we thought there was 250 or so people buried in the cemetery and um, we didn't know what we was gonna find, but when you look at these death records, you find some really amazing things, and then at the end, you'll see um, what we found. So this is a death record of Virginia Ford, who was a midwife in the Ferris Street District. Um, you can tell their date of birth, if they had a date of birth, how old they were, what their color classification was, what they died of, and their family genealogy, their father, their mother, um, who the informant was, where they lived. She lived on 138 East Cohea Street. They're currently trying to save the two homes on Cohea Street um, to, to tell the midwife story. But this is an amazing document that is available and open to the public uh, for free, but it tells you so much about the culture and lifestyle. And so, what we did, one, you know, after 200 hours, we, um, we had a database. And we originally thought it was 250 so, or so, but when we were done, we had names, over 1,500 names of people buried in Mount Olive Cemetery. And so 
it's quite amazing because, of course, you can only see 250 or so, and the other ones are, are unidentifiable, but you have a database that details when they were born, what their occupations were, and it's starting to tell the narration of West Jackson, the cultural assets of our community, and what came from our community. And so it's quite amazing what we found here. And so this is just a snapshot of the database, and um, this is also available. So we compiled all the information, and then we have our research findings. So that's what I'm going to go into now. Um, the burial site. So we can visibly see 268, and so that means 1,193 are un unidentifiable sites, meaning you can't, they have no headstone, they don't have, if you see a, a flower or a dip, that's a, a, a burial site. So we found out that many prominent uh, people from the community are buried here, doctors, lawyers, dentists, but there are also laymen buried here, individual, regular people who didn't have a lot of money. So they wouldn't have a headstone or a nice burial site just based off their income. Uh, just to clarify, this is an African-American cemetery. So this is primarily for, well, it is only African-Americans. And um, just to backtrack a little bit. So our research finds that it actually began as a plantation. This was part of the plantation where uh, they buried their slaves. And that's how it originally began. So this is a big puzzle and we're, we're putting pieces together. And so if I can go back here just to highlight. So this street here is actually Master Street. It's not Master Street anymore, but that's what it originally was. And so, and there was a, a plantation where Poindexter Park was. So we're putting all these pieces together and we're creating the narration. And we do have grave sites that are pre-emancipation. So going back to our research findings, so we talked about the burial sites, the birth dates. Why, why is all this information important? Because it provides us with empirical evidence of the treatment of African Americans during this time. Um, generally, we know that slaves didn't have birth dates, but this is documentation of that through their death records. So of the um, 1,500 uh, death records that we polled, 420 actually had a birth date, and 1,041 or 72% did not have a birth date. And that just shows you that during this time period, Africans and Americans were not thought to be valuable enough to be given a birth date. And so, again, this is empirical evidence showing the treatment and the culture of African Americans in Jackson, Mississippi. Another finding was the infants and children. So, um, of course, you have uh, death dates and what people uh, died of, but what was interesting was about 25% of the burials were of infants and children. And they did die of diseases of the time, such as cholera and measles and teething, but majority of the children, infants, um, were died because they didn't have access to a doctor. They were stillborn. And um, so, so, again, this is why you can't necessarily see their graves. I would imagine, um, you know, it was, it was a difficult time back then, and, um, but they are buried in the cemetery, and these are the findings that we're um, gathering. Another interesting thing was color classification. And so on the death record, it does say what your color is. And so um, based off the numbers that we polled, um, 238 people were color classified as black, uh, 202 were color classified as colored, uh, 547 were uh, classified as Negro, 29 individuals were color classified as yellow, and two individuals were actually classified as light. Yes, Joan? Were those classifications correlated when they died? There, there can be that extrapolation. Um, it does say that black, negro, and colored are interchangeably used. 
Um, but prior to, say, the 1920s is when you see the terminology yellow and light. And so, um, so yes, you can kind of trace the uh, etymology of the word. Is, am I <laughs> I'm saying that correctly? Okay. So moving on to occupations. So it was listed on the uh, death certificate what the occupations were. Now this is Virginia Ford, the, the lady, the midwife of Ferris Street. Um, her and her husband would go around Ferris Street in West Jackson and um, her husband would drive her and they would deliver babies. And this is how she made her life. And uh, she is a descendant of a slave, Mary uh, Scott. And um, so, so this is her. 77% of all the African-American women were listed as domestic laborers. So other occupations included field hands, laundress, cook, seamstress, school teacher, midwife, and beauty consultant. Again, we're telling the narration of the culture in Jackson, Mississippi. Now, men had a different array of occupations. 13% um, were common laborers, but their occupations included blacksmiths, brick mason, chauffeur, cotton spinner, drayman, farmer, machinist, um, waiter, and there was even one young man, and his occupation was an umbrella repairman. So that was quite interesting. And this is Milton Chameless, and he is um, the businessman and owner of the Chameless Shoe Hospital. And his building uh, that he worked out of is still on campus on Lynch Street. It is listed on the National Register, and they would repair shoes. So this is Milton. Another interesting point was the addresses. So when we pull the death records, we had 50% of them had a known address. And so this is important when you're talking about tracing your genealogy, figuring out where your heritage is, where people lived. You can actually pinpoint the street and address of relatives if you desire. Of course, cause of death is listed on the death record. 79% did have um, a cause of death, and many of them <clears throat> were based off, you know, malaria, pneumonia, no doctor, pellagra. Some of these things are uh, I didn't know about, but um, some you may. But if you're really interested in the medical profession, having access to these records may give you further research that you can do later on. Um, and we first saw the terminology of diabetes described in uh, 1914 based off these records. Place of birth. 42% um, of the individuals were born in Jackson, 12% uh, were in Hines County, and 46% um, other. Again, why is all this important? Well, this is the um, historical population map of the city of Jackson uh, starting in 1850, going all the way up to 1940. But say we take 1890, okay, in 1890, there was 5,920 people in this city. You divide that by race, and you can see that if you are from the city of Jackson, you probably have relatives buried in Mount Olive Cemetery. You just don't know. So um, I'm gonna actually start passing this book around. This is what we published, all the names of everyone that's buried in the cemetery. We, pu we published 214 books back in November, and that's my only one left. So I'll show you where you can get a PDF version, um, but it is something valuable to our community because if they don't know their relatives are buried there, they can look in that book and, and start that process of knowing. So <clears throat> we set out to do the research, we set out to um, identify and we, um, who's buried there, and we also set, set out to um, preserve some statues, some beautiful statues. So two prominent individuals that are buried in Mount Olive Cemetery. This is Mr. James Jim Hill, in which Jim Hill High School is named after. He was born a slave in the Holly Springs uh, plantation. His mother gave birth to him at the age of 14, and the, the father was the slave owner. Um, and 
After emancipation, he was elected Secretary of State from 1874 to 1878. And um, there has not been an African American elected to statewide office since Mr. Jim Hill. Now let me show you what the statue actually looked like before. And I get emotional about this piece because this is erected in 1909 and it's hand carved made out of granite and marble and it's literally a replica of him. It stands about 15 feet in statue and it's, it's, it's quite amazing when you're there in the presence of that. And I venture to say that the only reason that we have this relic of this time at this site is because it is his burial site. Um, if you can imagine in the early 1900s, they weren't building a lot of statues of African Americans. Um, and so to have this during this time period is quite magnificent. So we wanted to preserve it. So after lots of lots of labor and intensive cleaning, this is what his statue looks like today. And we're proud of the work that we did with that. We worked with Heavenly Monuments, West Haven Funeral Home, and Freddie Davis. Um, and I have a picture of them actually cleaning it. So this is, this is an attraction uh, for, for West Jackson. Um, I don't know all the, the African-American statues in our state, but I think that's for the research that we need to do to try and find out, because I, I would venture to say this was, these are the only ones built during this time, specifically in Jackson. Yes, ma'am. Do you know who underwrote the cost of having the statue erected? Who the artist was? We don't know who the artist was, but Jim Hill was a mason, and the Masonic Temple is right across the street. Many of the burials are of masons and eastern stars, and I would say that that had a big role in the erection of this marble and granite statue, but also um, just the, the clout that they had. And, and it wasn't damaged. Um, and I would say that's because it, um, of the masonry. All right. So that's Jim Hill. So we're going to move on to Ida Revels Redmond, who is the other statue that is near his statue. And um, it's the female version, and, and we're super proud of her, too. So Ida Revels Redmond was the daughter of Hiram Revels, the first African-American United States senator. She organized around the self-improvement uh, um, organizations around youth education and voter registration. She was the wife of Dr. Sidney Dillon Redmond, who was a lawyer and physician for the community. And you can imagine how many families she had to console with her husband being a rare African-American doctor of the time. She was the mother of Sidney Revels Redmond, who went on to become an NAACP lawyer, and her son graduated from Harvard Law School. We can't find a picture of what she looked like. All we have is this statue of her. And this is what her statue looks like as of today. And the next slide is actually how they had to clean the statues. You can't just go out there with a sandblaster because it is porous materials, it's very sensitive materials. So they had to use a solution called D2, and they also had to use soft bristle brushes and hand do it um, on ladders, and it was a laborious process, but this was the process necessary in order for the statues to be around for another 100 years. So, what are, what are the next steps? So thus far, we have, um, we have garnered about $26,000 for the, the preservation of the, the two statues and the research. Um, JSU has been maintaining Mount Olive Cemetery for the past two decades. Nobody owns the cemetery. Jackson State is doing this because of its close proximity to the campus but we are looking for other grants to help us um, maintain the cemetery and also preserve the cemetery. So we're writing additional grants. Um, 
we, we, we feel that this is a tourist destination. We feel that not only is Lynch Street Corridor a historic corridor with all of the civil rights activities that happened, you have the Masonic Temple, you have Kofo Building, Edgar Evers' uh, funeral was held at the Masonic Temple. We have a picture of Martin Luther King uh, Jr. walking down Lynch Street in front of the cemetery. Um, and Mount Olive Cemetery and the two historic statues that we've preserved are a part of that story. And we held the unveiling ceremony back in November. And this is the picture of that. Uh, you see representatives, you see senators here, but what you see is standing room only. So when I say this touched a nerve for people in the community, it really did. That day, uh, there wasn't a dry eye in the room because of the information that was garnered through the research and the booklet that was presented. In June of 2017, Mount Olive was listed on the National Register of Historic Places, which means it's worthy of preservation. The cemetery is no longer open. The last burial was in 97. So we are looking to, again, create it a place where people can pay homage, have serenity, um, but also look at the relics that we have. Our forefathers uh, built these statues so we can remember Jim Hill and Ida Revels. And when you think about the national context of the Confederate monuments and what's happening across our nation, we don't know what's gonna happen here in Mississippi. What we know is that we have these beautiful hand-carved statues of individuals of our community that we need to celebrate and visit and go just like if you would go to Martin Luther King or Coretta Scott King's burial site. We want people to come here and visit and, and learn that history, not just people, but our students too. So um, this is from the day, um, this is the Grand Master of Masonic Temple, Morris Lucas Sr. Um, and this is actually a picture of Jim Hill that Jim Hill High School student did. We also brought in Jim Hill as a participant in this project. This is Jim Hill's choir. They sung during the program, and, and they're an amazing, amazing choir. <laughs> um, so let me just say this in general about cemeteries. Originally, how people do research on cemeteries is they go and try and find the individual that their relative is, and that's how research is done on cemeteries. But this is a pilot project to show what you do with cemeteries that are abandoned or cemeteries that their family members have died off. It's not a one-person story. It's the collection of stories and information that you can gather that creates this space that builds upon just the individual's um, relative. And as we look for you know, the next 50 to 100 years, when we look at other cemeteries, that is how we have to look at preserving them and telling the story, not on an individual level, but on a collective narration um, telling the story that way. So um, we did complete the, the grant requirements. We also got a grant from Mississippi uh, Humanities Council. But our vision is to do more. This is just a, a basic rendering of what we want to do. Again, the only, the only sign that anyone knows about Mount Olive is this ugly. <laughs> little green and yellow sign here, which I don't feel gives the cemetery its justice. So we want to create a more grand uh, entrance that states that is a, it is a historic cemetery. We want to create a, a memorial wall that has water. Um, and we want to engrave everyone that's buried there in, in the wall, um, as well as landscaping and cleaning up some of the other uh, mausoleums and, and headstones. So we're almost, that's really, we're coming to an end. So 
Again, the book is being passed around. I need it back. We're working on some grants to try and get some more published. We do have some online at westjackson.com, and we can meet afterwards so I can direct you in the right place. Dr. Brown? Yes, Heather, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. Um, I wondered what was the research methodology that was used by Mississippi State to identify the, the, the bodies that were there, and then what methodologies would you use to identify the bodies that you have the records for? So we had limited information on the study that Mississippi State students did. Um, we believe that they went into the cemetery and documented all the headstones that they could visibly see and what they were. Uh, about 20 years ago when the study was done, the cemetery wasn't in as bad shape as it is now in terms of the headstones being broken. So they garnered most of the information from that. Um, so I don't have more details on the methodology. I know there is technology that can actually go out and go into the ground and identify where the bodies are exactly, but placing them with a name of who is actually there, I don't know if that's even possible. It may be possible or not, I'm not sure. But that's why we wanna do the memorial wall because we know individuals are there. I think you can decipher maybe like the, if it was a baby or a, a, a full scale person, you can do those things with the technology. But as far as determining exactly where a person is without the relative who would know, then that's something that may be unknown. And, and that is something that comes of this research. There's still questions that you may not be able to answer, but um, it's okay, <laughs> it's okay. Um, and that's, you just have to put that in your, in your research um, that these things aren't uh, attainable. Yes, sir. Is it in the database? Yes, so, so Natalie works uh, with Find a Grave, and so some of the research is in Find, find the Grave, but a lot of it is not. Um, just because that's a volunteer organization, there's not a lot of people to kind of just go around and mill through cemeteries. So um, we feel that pulling these death records um, was the best way to do that. Now, just caveat, the death records are only available through archives and history through 1909 to 1943. Well, there is the city of Jackson kept some records Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. But after 1943, you have to go through FIDO statistics to get a copy of a death record. And in order to do that, you have to pay a fee and you have to be a relative. So those, the reason we know some of those names is just based off their headstone. And that's why those are included. But um, those records are available through archives and history. And you can view them that way. Yes, ma'am. So yes, and actually there was two churches located on Lynch Street. Lynch Street Church and Pearl Street Church were both located on Lynch Street, and they actually maintained the cemetery at one period. The women would gather on Saturdays and cook a big meal, and the men would go out and clean up and, and, and uh, cut the grass and, and do things like that. Um, but as time went on, the churches moved to different locations based off their congregation growing, and those those churches no longer exist, um, and the buildings no longer exist. So that's how Jackson State became involved and started maintaining. But yes, churches and funeral homes are also good places to get your research. Yes. Yes, so um, Mount Olive was at the turn of the century, 1900s, was a privately owned African-American cemetery. And so I didn't know this, but if you were African-American during that time, like it was hard for you to get buried. You couldn't just, 
get buried anywhere. So um, yes, we do have individuals who uh, Walter Ferris, who Ferris Street is named after, is buried in Mount Olive Cemetery. So um, yes, I will give the caveat though that um, record keeping and even the death records were written in, in cursive handwriting, and so it made it sometimes makes it hard to decipher and. It's not like technology now where you can just type something in and it's, it's pretty and le le eligible to read. So those are some, some hiccups when you go to do some of this research. Sir, in the front. Uh, from the death records, has there been any, from the death records, has there been any, <clears throat> any uh, attempt to classify, to find out how many private cemeteries there are in uh, Hines County, because they, that well, should, when it, when it says where they're buried, that, that would, one might expect to find something like that there. I, I think more research is needed. Um, at this point, the only two cemeteries that's on the National Register of Historic Places is Greenwood and now Mount Olive. So, yeah. of course, there's many cemeteries in our city and Hines County, so I would, yes. Okay. Ma'am, here. Is there, uh, when did you find the name so it's in the William Winters building, and of course, circulation will help you kind of obtain them. It's just a general good idea to have a, a year range of when you think your relative died because they're sorted by county and by year. And so that'll help you kind of get into it, and it's on a microfish. So um, it's like 10 cents to print from there. Ma'am? So um, the statues are really, it, it's less close to here. They're really right here. There's one right here and one right here. So they're right next to each other, and they're facing east. And all the burials are facing east, to my knowledge. Ma'am? What's the street address for the cemetery? Well, it's in the 900 block of John R. Lynch Street. Yes, ma'am. Um, Hooker is further down uh, towards the um, uh, fire station. So it's further down um, Lynch Street. I'm trying to get there. Mm hmm. Other questions? Yeah, a hooker would be down here. And this is Terry Road. So it's for the day. Mm-hmm. <coughs> Sir. I wanted to ask you what the plantation was. So that's uh, another puzzle. Um, so Poindexter was the second governor of the state of Mississippi. And um, there was his plantation site um, where Poindexter Park is currently at. The home was demolished in the 1940s and um, there is some linkages there between a couple other individuals who own land in the community. And Poindexter Park historic neighborhood is one of the few neighborhoods where you saw African Americans and, and white people living together on literally the same street. Now, we believe that's because after emancipation, after they got off the plantation, they was able to build property, smaller homes, shotgun style homes, next to the antebellum homes in the neighborhood. And so uh, the, National Register um, is online to kind of view 
the information about Poindexter Park Historic District, but also a picture of the plantation is in there. And of course, this is where we get fuzzy, you know, because there's no like document that says Poindexter owned X amount of slaves. I mean, I haven't been able to find it. I'm not saying it's not there. I'm saying this type of information is not readily available and we have to put the pieces of the puzzle together. I'm saying we've identified Poindexter as a plantation site, which is near Capitol Street, and the rural nature of the area at that time. I believe that this was part of his plantation, and this is where they originally were burying the slaves um, at that time. But I can't definitively say that based off any information I've found, but that's what I believe. Sir. Yes. So um, his last name was Sharkey, who was affiliated with Poindexter. And now there was some language around Sharkey owning slaves. And so there was three landowners at the time. Uh, the third one is, I can't remember right now, but we're doing this research prior to even Mount Olive. Those are the things that are coming up. But it, it is hard to definitively pinpoint um, this clear line of what happened. But I will say the topography of the landscape, if you go to Poindexter Park or even the cemetery, once you pass Gallatin Street, you come up this hill. And during that time period, people wanted you to know who they were when they were coming into the city. So the plantation and the cemetery sit on top of a hill. So the landscape and the topography of the land gives you the feeling of what people, what they wanted you to think when you were coming into the city of Jackson. And this is all part of putting the pieces together. Ma'am. Yes. It is not in my book because I didn't want to definitively say that. But it is in the uh, database through Archives and History under Poindexter Park Historic Neighborhood, Historic District. And um, I would be happy to make sure you get that link or send it to you because I'm fascinated by it. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. And I just stumbled across that article and just thought it was telling that we start or we want to do something, and not just me, not just you, but collectively, I think we all want to do something. And I'm hoping that our younger folks will get involved and take up the, the, the baton, because it's up to them to not only learn, but if you're a certain age, I mean, you shouldn't be doing this work because you've done the work. And it's up to us to kind of, you know, learn from you and help you and then us take it over and, and do bigger and better things, put it in databases, put it online, all, do the things young folks can do. <laughs> Other questions? Yes, ma'am, please. I think we have time. I think you do too. Uh, first of all, Walter Farish's daughter, Minnie Farish, was the first African American Girl Scout director or something for the state of Mississippi. But she was biracial. Mm -hmm. I thought Walter Farish was white. And you're saying he's not? Or you're just saying that he's buried in Mount Olive? I'm saying he's buried in Mount Olive. Okay. And I. That that's fine. I, I don't think That's he fine. was, but I, I could be wrong, but what I will say is there are other Mount Olive cemeteries. So we came across records that had the white 
color classification. But when we started to look at this, the record, we determined that there was Mount Olives in other places in Hines County, not this Mount Olive. And so there was, I would say out of 1,500 records, we came across five and we pulled them out because of all the information that we had gathered th thus far and um, who's buried there. Yes, there were several funeral homes bearing Collins, um, Peoples, um, all of those um, funeral homes were burying in this cemetery. But that record can be pulled and we can look. Sir? Uh, that was one of my questions and you've just touched on that. Uh, are you, your confidence level uh, when it says Mount Olive that that's this cemetery, that seems like that would be a common name for cemeteries. Uh, the other thing is we had a presentation here at History's Lunch uh, a while back on Greenwood Cemetery where they did the ground penetrating mm -hmm. radar, I guess that's the right term, and, uh, and were able to locate where m many grave sites were uh, in there. And that would be, I, I, I don't know what the cost involved, but that would be very interesting to see if that approaches your thousand plus figure or could be even more because your uh, death certificate information, there may be a lot of early burials that predate your death certificate information. Absolutely. Uh, and we, we do think there probably are more um, just based off what you said in our research. So if there are no other questions, I want to thank, oh. Another question. Yes, ma'am. You spoke of the last person to be buried in the Mount Olive Cemetery was in 97. Yes, ma'am. Uh, are you at liberty to say who that was? Um, her, her first name was Barbara. I can't think of her last name at this point, point but it is in the book. Um, it's in the book. So we do have that. Any other questions? The book is going to be found online at. Oh, it's right, right here. No, the book is available online for free. Just go to the westjxn.com website. And I have cards I'll pass out. The website's on there. And you just type in research book and it'll be um, available there. We are looking to write some other grants through Archives and History to print additional books um, because they are a pretty hot commodity and they cost about $10 per book to print. So um, I do want to thank uh, Mississippi Department of Archives and History who supported this project, the Mississippi Humanities Council, as well as the city of Jackson and all of my West Jackson community folks because being here and giving me that daily support and, and encouragement is very beneficial and um, they've been helpful through this process. Thank you all for coming today. This is really the sort of project that I love to hear about and to have highlighted at History's Lunch. It's a great local project that you can really dig into and as Heather has demonstrated, they have done that with hundreds of hours of research, but also there's so much more that can be done. So I look forward to hearing updates as we move forward with it. Thank you all for coming. I hope we see you next week. Help me thank Heather Wilcox again.